One of the big things about this season is that Red Bull seems to have fallen off the proverbial cliff and they've not been as dominant now as they had been last season or through 2022. Because at the time of writing this video, they've not won in a long time, which is a dry spell they've not had in, well, a, a long time. But while the general belief is that Red Bull has fallen off, the reality is the other teams have caught up at the same time. And I mentioned this in a video about this Fiddle Break 2.0 TM stuff that came out well, last week. I mean, the video was done last week, but the news was also sort of confirmed last week. But either way, it seems odd that a team would make such a massive stride in the early part of a season to catch up, and then make another stride to then be the fastest car on the grid. And this happened during the 2009 season, when Braun had the initial advantage thanks to their double diffuser. But then, Red Bull and McLaren started to catch up, by the virtue of Braun not being able to develop the car beyond what they already had. It seems that the same thing has happened here, but what needs to be taken into account though, is that McLaren managed to catch up in the first quarter or so of the season. The question is, how? Because in this modern world of cost caps, limited wind tunnel testing and well, everything else that the FIA has tried to implement, McLaren has managed to gain so much time in, well, such little time. Now I've been watching for 30 years and I've never seen anything like it. So McLaren must be cheating, right? Hey, hey, now, come on, let's look at this rationally. I know it's hard for some people to do, so I'll just do it for you. So back at the start of the season, McLaren had struggled at the opening round in Bahrain. The two Ferraris had been fastest in the first two qualifying sessions, but then Verstappen took pole by about three tenths of a second from Leclerc, with Russell in third. The two McLarens were down in seventh and eighth, half a second off Verstappen. So it's not like it's the 90s when seventh and eighth could be one and a half seconds off the pace. The gap was, in inverted commas, just half a second. It's not bad, but at the same time, it's not great, because half a second a lap equates to one second every two laps. So if you assume that the McLaren's qualifying pace was the same as its race pace, it would be a 28.5 second deficit to Verstappen at the end of the Grand Prix. So, yeah, that's, that, that's quite a distance behind. But it wasn't 28.5 seconds. It was 48 seconds. It was almost a minute to Oscar and Max destroyed the field. Perez came through from 5th to 2nd, something that he can't do for Pi these days. So it was clear that Red Bull was still going to be the team to beat, if they could be beaten in 2024. The only saving grace from the Bahrain Grand Prix was that Lando split the two Mercedes, which were struggling with ERS and engine temperature problems. For round two in Saudi Arabia, it was the same as it was in Bahrain. Verstappen on pole by three tenths with Leclerc in second, but this time Perez had moved up to third. Piastri took a decent fifth, but Lando was in sixth, almost seven tenths off the pace. Piastri, six tenths off. So the gap to the Red Bull still around the same, but they were behind Alonso in the Aston Martin for both races. While Lando briefly led the Grand Prix, he would ultimately finish in eighth, two places down on where he started, while Oscar moved up one into fourth ahead of Alonso. Now this isn't entirely down to car pace, as Norris was left out during the safety car period caused by Stroll binning it, and this messed him around a bit. And going into the Saturday and Sunday of that particular race weekend, Lando had actually admitted that McLaren was going to be on the back foot. Just certain corners that I'm struggling to get a nice, a good balance with. Especially around here, you want to be able to feel comfortable and be able to push all the way up to the walls and things like that. Yeah, not a few corners. Too many that I'm not feeling comfortable with just yet, so a bit of work to do on some of them. He also expected to qualify where he had done in Bahrain, and the pecking order to remain the same since nobody had really started applying upgrades to the car yet, since it was only race two. And Piastri had a similar feeling, saying, We've looked good at certain points, we've looked not so good at certain points, so it's a little bit difficult to get a read on where we sit, but definitely we have some improvements to try and make tomorrow, so yeah, we'll see what we can do. It looks pretty tight and pretty mixed in the middle there, so yeah, we'll see how we can do. He also said that Alonso's Aston looked quick, but the grid was pretty even over one lap and that could help them, but only really if someone messed up. But McLaren knew exactly what needed fixing. They knew that the car was struggling in slow corners, and this was a problem that they'd had since the start of 2022 when the ground effect regulations came into effect. But they often had the best car through high speed turns, as they were the fastest cars through the first sector at Jeddah, which is, well, mostly, high speed turns. Except for turns one and two. But to be honest, the layout of that circuit is something I'm not overly familiar with. I need to drive it at some point. But make the corners too long and the McLaren starts to suffer, particularly through the bit on the track map that is turns 25 and 26 where you're constantly turning in one direction. 
But if you have corners where you're constantly going backwards and forwards between the directions, like the opening sector at Suzuka, Maggots and Beckett's at Silverstone, or Sector 1 at Jeddah, then the McLaren was in a class of its own. So with that in mind, McLaren came up with a plan to get the car to be better than it already was, a new front wing and improvements to the suspension geometry that would allow for better aero and better mechanical performance at slow speed, as the range of the A-spec McLaren in early 2024 had a mid to high ceiling in terms of performance, with a floor that was much lower than it is now, floor being the worst point of its performance rather than the floor of the car. Fourth and sixth for Australia, which became third and fifth after Perez impeded Hülkenberg in qualifying, with the gap to Verstappen down to three tenths. Now, was this because of the later brake issues Verstappen had, or is it due to an inherent problem that the Red Bull has had over bumps and curbs this year? And now that the Red Bull isn't as overpowered as it was last season, the flaws are much more noticeable. Answers on a postcard. But at the end of the race, Verstappen was out with brake issues, Perez was fifth, and Ferrari achieved a 1-2 with Norris in third and Piastri in fourth. The upward trend was continuing, but McLaren's first big upgrade to the car wasn't expected until at least Miami, if not then, Imola. Suzuka did put a dent in that upward trend. While Norris had been third in qualifying, he'd finished fifth and Piastri was eighth after starting sixth. In China, Lando did take pole for the sprint race in challenging conditions, but slipped to sixth in the race. He then qualified fourth for the feature race. I mean, is that what we have to call it? I'm just stuck in 90s BTCC mode, but still managed to achieve what was then his best result of the season, second. But he was still behind Verstappen, who won by 13 seconds. McLaren's big upgrade came at Miami instead of Imola, and on the little declaration sheet they had to fill in for the FIA, they had 10 things that they'd improved on. A massive upgrade. They were the following, and I've just copy-pasted this from Autosport because they just got it all down. A completely new front wing, which works in conjunction with brake ducts and front suspension to increase overall downforce. A new front suspension geometry to help support the airflow off the front wing and better condition it for the rest of the car. They revised the front brake duct and winglet that helps better manage airflow off the front wing. They completely revised the floor that works with the new side pod inlets and bodywork to increase downforce. They revised the side pod inlet to complement the changes with airflow and along with the new bodywork help improve the feeding of the air to the rear of the car. They changed the engine cover to improve the aerodynamic efficiency that worked with the side pod inlet. They made upgrades to the cooling to suit the change in the airflow field in this area of the car. Updated the rear suspension to capitalise on the new airflow and help improve load generation with the new rear brake ducts. Revised the rear brake ducts and the winglets to add more rear downforce. And designed a new offloaded beam wing to better trade the load between it and the rear wing, which should have suited the car at Miami. Like I said, a considerable amount of upgrades. Get it right, they look like engineering geniuses. Get it wrong, and they're screwed. Because of the cost caps, they couldn't just spray money up the wall to fix it if they got it completely wrong. Autosport reported that virtually every surface on Lando's car had changed. It provided more clean downforce so that the car was quicker in the corners, and that in turn allowed them to run less wing than before. They were turning the wings up to help in slower corners, and the second that that was fixed, they could turn the wings down, and the car was instantly faster in a straight line. But the turnaround was not instant by any means. Lando was ninth in the sprint qualifying session after being fastest in the first two segments, and was then wiped out in a collision, where he also copped a €50,000 fine for returning to the pit lane while on a live track. For the qualifying for the race proper, Lando was fifth, but three tenths off Verstappen in a highly competitive third session. To be fair though, Piastri got an absolutely brilliant start at the Miami Grand Prix, although he was helped by Perez almost wiping out Sainz and Verstappen. And while Norris had been fortunate with the safety car that came out during the Miami Grand Prix, at the restart of the race he'd not only defended from Max, but also managed to pull away a bit. But I think Lando might have had fresher tyres than Max because of how that safety car thing worked, so it was all quite confusing. It's actually easier to just check the highlights. Verstappen pitted on lap 28 just after the virtual safety car, but then when the actual safety car came out, Norris was in the right place at the right time to take tyres. So Norris had like four lap fresher tyres, so that would have helped. But it was clear that once that McLaren was in clean air, it was rapid. McLaren seemed happy with the upgrades and how it finally put to bed the Lando no wins meme as well as that lingering feeling of what was lost at the 2021 Russian Grand Prix. But they felt that the car could be even better at Imola and be even closer to the front without the need for safety car intervention and Piastri would now have these upgrades for Imola too. And the car was good at Imola, less than a tenth separated Verstappen, Piastri and Norris in qualifying but Piastri was hit with a grid drop after impeding. 
But one thing was clear from these upgrades, which included a new beam wing for Imola, is that the car was now in a position where McLaren would be challenging for wins. Three quarters of a second is what Norris missed out by come the end, having clawed the gap down from six seconds in the final 15 laps. Verstappen was saying by lap 51 his tyres weren't working anymore, while Norris had managed to save them a tiny bit longer, but probably needed just one more lap or maybe two laps to get two wins in two. So McLaren had a car that worked and could challenge for the win, but the true test would be Monaco as to whether the slow speed stuff had been tuned out. Piastri being two tenths off at Monaco suggested that it had been tuned out and they had a better time of it than Red Bull and Mercedes had, but despite Max being in sixth, the gap wasn't that big. Hundredths is what it was between Lando and Max, but Oscar had put a tenth between him and Verstappen. But the thing is, it's Monaco, they spent almost 80 laps doing absolutely nothing because it's so easy to save the tyres there because there's just no way of overtaking. So we'll ignore all that and just move on to the next one. Canada was also close, two hundredths off pole, and the wind tunnel simulations were able to help optimise the car that now had a higher ceiling and a higher floor. By that, what I mean is the car at its worst was almost the previous iteration of the car's best, but the higher ceiling allows for McLaren to have a wider setup window and better performance within that setup window, so it's just gains upon gains upon gains, and they were now able to extract all of that better than anybody else. Aston Martin, meanwhile, seemed to have gone the other way with upgrades, and that was seeing them slide back, while Red Bull's internal squabbling, Nui leaving, the Horner allegations, and their own upgrade path seemed to be adding on to their diminishing returns. McLaren didn't bring any upgrades to Canada, but it looked like that Lando was set up more for the wet conditions, because as soon as the track dried out, Max was gone. At Barcelona, some one lap pace had been extracted as Lando managed to bag pole, but only by a couple of hundredths. Both cars and drivers were the class of the field that day, as Max was just two seconds clear of Lando come the end, while Hamilton in third was 15 seconds behind Lando. But it seemed by this point, at least, Red Bull's monopoly on the top step of the podium was coming to an end, and McLaren's gamble with this massive upgrade at Miami had well and truly paid off. But McLaren didn't just stop there, because that would be silly. F1 is an arms race. At Austria, a new front wing and reprofiled front suspension were put on the car with the hope of improving aero efficiency towards the floor and the diffuser. It's not like they completely changed the look of the entire front wing, because looking at Ted Kravitz's little dive on the assembly, it's tiny little details that made for a massive difference. The problem is though that the Austrian Grand Prix ended in the way it did. The contact between Norris and Verstappen towards the end that allowed for Russell to say, cheers lads, I'll have that. But McLaren had been helped by a slow pit stop and Max had been put on older tyres too. So there was that overlap there but still, Lando was catching up to Max but then went a little bit too aggressive trying to get by and lost a win. More updates came for Silverstone, and this pretty much saw McLaren solidify themselves as the number one challenger to Red Bull. While Lando was third behind Lewis and George, there was a decent gap there to Max in fourth, with Oscar only just off Max's time. One of the key upgrades for the British Grand Prix was a new rear wing that was low drag, but still produced enough rear end grip, and this was all tied into the side pod suspension and front wing upgrades brought to Austria. One thing that the McLaren seemed to have now over Red Bull was a tyre wear advantage. While Max had initially got past Lando in the opening stages of the British Grand Prix, by lap 20, Lando and Oscar had sailed past him on the hangar straight because of the superior grip through Maggots and Beckett's and managed to take the position into Stowe. But then McLaren wet the bed on strategy and handed the win to Hamilton. There was the sting of losing a 1-2, but at the Hungarian Grand Prix that was rectified and they got what they wanted. Max meanwhile lost out through handling issues and a collision with Hamilton. But from this, McLaren has managed to move forward with its upgrades. Red Bull meanwhile is reverting to try and make the car easier to drive. At the Dutch Grand Prix the weekend just gone, McLaren brought another upgrade package, bringing new brake scoops, new suspension, new floor edges, modified rear suspension, a new high downforce wing and a new beam wing. Red Bull, meanwhile, as just mentioned, had to revert to older parts due to the way the upgrade path hasn't really worked for them. Verstappen was running a floor that was on the car at the start of the season. As such, while Lando once again lost out to Max at the start, as the race went on, he passed on the start-finish straight with DRS, and that was it. He was gone. It was a demolition in Max's backyard to the tune of how Max was destroying everybody last season. It just seemed that McLaren had clicked at that particular Grand Prix, Lando putting in that mammoth pole position time and then just going off into the distance with a car that seemed to really suit the breezy conditions. 
But McLaren fans shouldn't get excited just yet because, according to the race, there are Red Bull upgrades coming and that might shift the balance back in favour of, well, Red Bull. They might be able to pull things back in the right direction, but as it stands, McLaren has completed one hell of a turnaround that saw Norris go absolutely ham at Zandvoort. But it's all to do now with whether or not Red Bull can catch back up, as they are now in danger of losing the constructors to McLaren because, at the time of writing, McLaren has outscored Red Bull in the last eight races. They are now just 30 points off the constructors' championship lead. But McLaren wants to add a couple more upgrades here and there, and it's natural to assume that McLaren will take things forward into 2025 and use this car as a basis for the next one. But then you've got the underlying question of will it be like this for next season? Or has Red Bull got something cooking for the RB21? Because, as Pierre Vacher said, they've hit the ceiling for this particular car, but not for the regulations. So only time will tell, I guess. But there's also the threat of Mercedes looking to ruin any potential parties. While the Mercedes has had flashes of being up at the front and has won three races this season, Zandvoort was one of those races where it was underwhelming. If McLaren wants to win the Constructors' Championship this year, it's got to look at Red Bull and Mercedes, because there is, and has been, the occasion where Russell and Hamilton have mopped up leftovers as seen at Silverstone when McLaren got it wrong and gave Hamilton the opening he needed, and also Lando driving too aggressively that led to the collision at Austria and handed Russell a win. So there's still plenty going on for the final few races of the season. Can McLaren maintain this and potentially win the Constructors' Championship this year, or will Red Bull's upgrades bring them back where they need to be and gain some momentum? But like I say, only time will tell, but do let me know down in the comments as to what you think. So then, a look at how McLaren managed to turn things around after only a few races to be challenging for wins and now being very real contenders for the Constructors' Championship this year. If this has been an interesting look at things and something that has given you some food for thought, do like this video so I know that a good job was done, and for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the mad lads at Patreon that continue to support me at a more personal level. And if you want to help out with keeping things running around here, a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates, and other bits and bobs you might want or need to know. Well, the super thanks down there if you just want to buy me a coffee, and there's also memberships for a Patreon alternative. So until next time, I've been Ada Mord. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.